Man, I want to I want to go to heaven. Hey, man. Before Friday. It won't be 102 in heaven. It'll be 102 at the other place. At least. That's at the doorstep. But not in heaven. Amen. Amen. Everybody having a good week so far? Amen. God's been good to you so far. You've been praying. What good does it do for me to teach you and preach to you about prayer if you ain't going to pray? Learn how to pray. Learn how to pray when you're busy. Learn how to pray when you're driving. Learn how to talk to God uh, when you're doing your daily chores, when you're going about your daily business. Um, when you're running butts. That's not what you think I said. I was talking to Brian over here. He's a drywall taper. A butt joint, two pieces of drywall stuck together. And you have to, there's a lot of work that goes into a butt joint. So we call it running butts. And you can talk to God, especially, especially then. When they won't come out right and there's a big hump there and you can see it halfway across the room. But anyway... Learn how to talk to God any time of day. Learn how to talk to God. Who does this? Who tries to pray at night in your bed and you go to sleep while you're praying? Okay? And I used to feel guilty about that. Okay? But I don't anymore. I don't feel... I mean, I'd like to stay and pray all night. Okay? But what better way to end your day? God knows you need sleep. And who knows, God may have been the one to say, go to sleep. Would you shut your mouth for a little while? I've, I've heard enough from you today. Nah, he won't do that. But um, I can't remember. There's a psalm. David saying something about laying his head down at night, talking to the Lord. I can't, huh? When, yeah. When thou liest, when thou rises up, when thou liest down. So learn how to pray at night. Learn how to pray in the morning. When you, when you first sit up, sit on the edge of the bed before you do anything. Just sit there and just say, God, this day you'll have to take it from here on out because what I want to do is go back to bed. Learn how to do that and, and pray over big things. Learn how to pray over little things. What, 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 does, what small decision in life do we make that's too important? Too small for God to help us. There isn't anything. And uh, so, just learn how to talk to your Heavenly Father. Learn how to share with Him. And He's listening. I promise you, He's listening. Turn your Bible to John chapter 4, if you would. Uh, we've been looking at the story of the woman at the well. And I'm not going to go over, uh, I'm not going to start at the beginning of chapter 4 and read all the way through this. Uh, but you know the story. Um, he was at Jacob's well. A woman from Samaria, a Samaritan, came to him. She was of a different group of Jews. There was a racism issue there. And we talked about that. Um, talked about the, the, the water that Jesus had versus the water that the world has. And I'm just, I'll say it again, I'll say it, I could say this in every sermon and not get tired of it. If you are truly born again, there is no other religion you'll choose. You will not, you'll not jump out and jump on somebody else, some other religion. Because you've already taken the drink that satisfies you everlastingly. It is like the, it is like the fountain of youth. Once you've drank, once you've taken a drink... Of the fountain of life from Jesus Christ himself, you will never thirst again. Uh, you know, you have a story of that in the Bible. You have Elijah, who was, who was fed by God and went on the strength of that meat for 40 days. He didn't have, it's not that he, it's not that he starved for 40 days after that. 
he didn't need to nor desire to eat for 40 days after that. And that's a picture, of, to me, of eternal life. Once God feeds you, you are satisfied forever. I am satisfied that this is the Word of God. And I'm not going through other religious books thinking I'm going to find something better than what I've already found here. I've already found it. Amen? So, uh, I, had a, I had a pastor tell me one time when I was a young man in Bible college. Uh, because uh, there was some... There was some I had a decision to make about what direction to go in at a certain point in my life. And uh, this pastor was trying to encourage me. He said, Mike, do you feel like you're in God's will now? And I said, yeah. And he said, if you're in God's will, why would you search for God's will? It made a lot of sense to me. So I just rested where I was and God blessed it. John chapter 4. Let's pick it up in verse 25. Uh, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. What does Messiah and Christ mean? What do those two words mean? What do we say? Anointed. The anointed one. Okay? God has sanctioned him. He's poured oil over him like uh, Samuel did with Saul and David. He has sanctioned them to be uh, his king of kings and lord of lords and so on. And she said, we know that when he has come, he will tell us all things. In verse 26, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Uh, I've had people call and talk on the phone before. And they've talked to me as if I was just somebody that worked here. And they'd say, now you be sure and tell Pastor Mike this. And I said, you just told him. Is this Pastor Mike? I said, yeah. Well, it don't sound like you. Well, I don't, not, not, I'm not using my radio voice. I have a different voice. But anyway, he said, I that speak unto thee am he. Verse 27. Uh, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? The disciples were pretty smart. They knew not to jump into it and mess it all up. The woman then left her water pot, went, in, went her way into the city saith to the men, come and see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Now stop and think about this. And just a, just a small little thought here for you. You can tell she, wa she was right with God and the people that she talked to were right with God. We already know that Jesus told her her sins. Jesus told her her sins. Jesus said, I know that you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. The man you're with right now is not your husband. He, he told her sins to her face. She doesn't get mad at him. What are, you, what are you calling me a whore? How dare you talk to me that way? She didn't get mad at him. She was glad that she finally found the Messiah, the prophet of God that could tell her what kind of life she'd lived. She goes into town, tells these men, I found the Messiah. He's told me everything that I've ever done wrong. She went running back. The men came running back. But I'll tell you what, you'll find that hard to do nowadays is confront people with their sin and then say, thank you for telling me my sins. Please tell me more. I want to know when I'm wrong. I want to know when I'm not right with God. You don't find too many people like that anymore. But these guys, they were excited because this man was going to tell them their sins and cause them to confess. And they wanted to be right with God. That just kind of stood out to me just, just here, just now. And uh, never thought about that before, but you think about that, all right? Uh, let's see here. They, verse 30, they went out of the city, came unto him. Last Wednesday night, we talked about that. You have to leave the city. You're going to have to come out of Babylon. Uh, in fact, I, I didn't finish this. Turn to Revelation 18 very quickly, and then, then we'll move on from there. Revelation 18 is sort of a companion to Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah 51. Revelation 17 and Revelation 18 are companion verses to those two. Uh, 
uh, or companion chapters to those two. In Revelation 18, verse 1, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, and it is fallen. Why do you suppose he said it twice? Because it happens twice. Think of Dagon, the, the idol Dagon, that was half human, half fish. In 1 Samuel chapter uh, 4 and 5, they took the Ark of the Covenant and sat it in front of this pagan god called Dagon. And he, they were thinking that we have brought this great gift to our god Dagon. They come in the next morning, Dagon has fallen down on his face before the Ark of the Covenant. Because every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. So they stood Dagon back up. That's a very powerful God they have. A God who's so powerful, he cannot stand himself back up. They had to do it for him. The next morning they come in. Dagon is fallen. Again, he's fallen. He fell twice. And this time uh, he broke. And what was left were the, the stump of his hands, I think. Something like that. Anyway, he broke. And after that, they said, we got to get rid of this Ark of the Covenant. Don't get rid of Dagon. Get rid of the Ark of the Covenant. But God was showing them right then and there how powerful he was up against any other God. He's not going to bow to Dagon. Dagon's going to bow to him. Okay? But that's why I see it says here, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It happened once at Calvary. The power of Babylon, the power of the strength of, of the mystery religions, the mystery cults, things like that where the priesthood always held power over the people. They said, you do what we tell you to do. You bow before the idols we tell you to bow before. You pay the money we tell you to pay. You do for us what we tell you to do. And then you might, you might please the gods. Those days are over with. But just like just like before, she's risen back now. She's back at it again. She is deceiving many people with the wine of her fornication. And she has fallen again. And this time, when she falls, no one's going to be there to build her back up again. No one's going to be there to pick her back up again. Uh, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, verse 2, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Uh, I asked the question one time here a while back, do you believe in haunted houses? I do. I believe in haunted houses, haunted places. I believe that spirits literally thrive in certain areas on this earth. And here you have it. That wherever the spirit of Babylon is, it is going to be a location where foul spirits, devils, Unclean and hateful birds. Birds are always a picture of angels in the Bible, whether good or bad. You have the dove, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. You have things like ravens and eagles and things like that because they eat flesh. They're pictures of unclean birds. So they're pictures of devils. They're pictures of evil angels, uh, unclean spirits and whatnot. But that's what Babylon is. Babylon is the the hold or the dwelling place of all of these spirits. I like telling this story because it just rings so true. My mom is with her friends this week on a little road trip. And they've done this before. And they decided to just go to this random church in town. And when they went in there, all of a sudden, man, it just, just nothing felt right. And they felt very uncomfortable that just sitting there, people coming in and and then all of a sudden they started cranking that music up and they recognized it. it was, they were playing, um, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Do, 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 do. They were playing that at the beginning of the service. And they all three looked at each other and said, let's get out of here. They said they never, never felt right that whole time. They didn't stay for the service, but there was just, and you know why? There were spirits in that place that the Holy Spirit that was in them said, this, this is not for you. This is not your place. And I guarantee you, the devils that were in that place were going, get out of here. You're going to ruin our service. 
They don't want us around, amen? But that's, that's what it is. I believe in those things. I believe and, and I believe they are manifested from time to time. What does that mean? I believe they're seen. I have known people. I've never done this. I was always told, don't mess with Ouija boards. You know what that is? It's, it's, Milton Bradley made them. The board's got all these letters and numbers on it, yes or no. And it's some kind of stylus that everybody's supposed to gently lay their hand on it. And you ask spirits questions and the thing's supposed to move by itself. And I had some people that rode the bus with me in school one time. They were telling us they had a party in one of these girls' basements and they pulled out a Ouija board. Midnight and they're doing this Ouija board thing and the thing lifted up about that far off the table and buddy I want to tell you what That was the last time they told me about that and of course their mom and dad didn't believe them. I did the, You will see things on the internet some of that's spoof some of that's fake, but some of it's real. I absolutely believe devils manifest themselves to people at certain times they love, listen to me, they love to instill fear in humans. That is what they do, and they do it very well. Okay? I've heard their voices in my head. Does that make me crazy? What else? What does? Something obviously is. But anyway, uh, that's Babylon for you. Uh, verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. See, Babylon's always on the side of the rich, the wealthy. Uh, and she's all about trafficking, merchandise, selling this, selling that. Pastors who get book deals, pastors who sell their things or sell their books or whatever speakers who get enormous speaker fees inside what's called the Christian movement in in this country and it's done everywhere that and and I know this for a fact Michael told me this and I know it for a fact I know what happens uh, we came across uh, a church in Kenya the pastor, the elder, he was the old man of that church. He was the pastor. It's a pretty good-sized church. But he had three or four sons, and he would send them regularly to America to go speak at American churches to get American churches to throw literally thousands and thousands of dollars at this man's church. They would tell them, oh, we're feeding the poor, we're helping these orphans, we're doing this, we're doing that. And that pastor was constantly sending his sons to America to bankroll his lifestyle. Constantly doing that. Uh, so it's, it's everywhere. Uh, verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Come out of her. Leave her. Don't be partakers with her. Separ biblical separation. You need to separate yourself from certain friends that you have. And if you don't, God will separate them for you. He will sever them away from you. To, just to save you, God will sever you from friends, loved ones, family members. He will take those things out of your life to save you is what he'll do. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to, their, to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. Generally, what do the rich and the wealthy do in this world when it comes to poor people? Do they give or take? They take. Why? 
Because having $14 billion in the bank is not enough. Had being worth $50 billion is not enough. So you don't put factories where they're going to manufacture your stuff in a place where they're going to get good wages. You're going to put it in a place and, you know, I guess thank God that somebody's now has a job, but you're going to put it in a place where you can pay them 50 cents an hour to put your stuff together so you can make billions off of it and not ever give back to the people. Uh, I know a pastor that knew Sam Walton. Sam Walton got a lot of criticism for not, for, and, and they still to this day, they go after Walmart because it's a non-union store. And when the unions really started putting pressure on Sam Walton to unionize the labor at Walmart, he said, I'm not going to do that, but I'll tell you what I will do. I'll start giving out dividends to the workers that are here. In other words, if I, from now on, if I make money, they're going to make more money too. And he gave stock away. The first stock offering that Sam Walton had with Walmart, several of his truck drivers are multi-millionaires now. Truck drivers. Because he offered them stock and they took it and that stock split and that stock split again. And the longer Walmart was in business, the more money those truck drivers, you got truck drivers who were millionaires now. Okay, that's the right way to do it. Or that's one of the right ways to do it. But anyway, reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her according to her works in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. So that's Babylon. That's what, it, that's what that meant, come out of the city. If you're going to find Christ, he's not going to be in Babylon. He's not going to be there in, in that place. That place is going to be destroyed. Noah had to be separated from the world. Lot had to be separated from Sodom. Abraham had to be taken out of his country. Ruth had to be separated from Moab, taken out of the land of her nativity. So she could be blessed with Israel and God calls each and every one of us out. Now, back to John chapter 4, if you would please. John chapter 4. His, if you remember at the beginning of this, the disciples were not here while Jesus is talking to this woman. Why? Because they went in town to get food. Now they've come back. And now, here's this woman and probably all these people in town. He's drawn a crowd. He's preaching to them. So, in John chapter 4, um, verse 31. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. Verse 32, but he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Now, Stop right here just for a minute and, ex and think about this chapter as a whole. What have we seen so far out of this one chapter? We have one woman coming to Jesus, wanting water. And instead of getting the well water, she gets the everlasting water. Because Jesus says, I already have water and I will give you water. She says, you don't even have a pot to pull it out with. He said, the water I have to give you doesn't come from here. It comes from heaven. It comes from me. So once she drinks of it, she'll have everlasting life. Now the disciples come with food. And it's the same thing. Master, why don't you eat? Jesus says, I have food that you know not of. And they're going... Did you go to McDonald's while we were gone or what? Okay. They didn't understand this. I have meat that you know not of. Verse 33. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Verse 35. Say not ye, 
there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Where do we get our food from? We get it from the harvest. Whether we harvest grain, we harvest vegetables, or we harvest animals. It's time to slaughter the pigs. It's time to slaughter the cattle. It's time to go deer hunting. It's time to go get some squirrels or whatever it is. But we harvest them. In verse 36, And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored and you are entered into their labors. Now, I, I'm going to back up here in a little bit, but while I'm thinking about this, I want you to think about this for a minute. You're holding in your hand a Bible that you did not write. A book that has saved your life, given you profound wisdom that the greatest scholars of this world cannot attain to nor comprehend. You've been given this and you've not earned anything that is in that Bible. Others did. In fact, most of the men who were participating in writing this Bible had very difficult lives. Some were even killed because of what they knew and what they believed. So you not only have the labor of those who wrote the Word of God, you have the labor of those who helped preserve the Word of God, making copies, the scribes in the Old Testament, the priesthood of the believer in the New Testament, faithfully copying the letters that Paul wrote, the Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Revelation, faithfully copying those things, transmitting them to the brethren, sending them to the churches, the churches collecting them, keeping them, in some cases at risk and at peril of their lives because if they found out, if the government found out that this group of people had these books, they would probably be arrested and these books would be burnt. Then throughout the Dark Ages, into the Middle Ages, you have people who have compiled this Bible, believing its words, believing that God's word was superior than the Pope of Rome, choosing not to believe the Pope, but to believe the word of God, giving, spilling their blood, being hanged, being tortured, being burned at the stake just because they had a copy of this Bible. That same thing still exists to this day in certain countries around the world. You could be killed for having a copy of a Bible. You could be killed for that. Back in the days of the old Soviet Union, there was a man by the name of Brother Andrew. God saved him, and God put it in his heart one day to try to smuggle a Bible in behind the Iron Curtain. And he got away with it. And the person he got the Bible to, he goes to see him sometime later, and the guy says, do you have any more of these? We need, we've got some people that have gotten saved, they need, they need Bibles. So he goes back across the border grabs more Bibles and smuggles them across the Iron Curtain. If they find him, they'll arrest him and, and probably hold him there, put him in a gulag somewhere. This is in the days of Stalin. And this man became known as God's smuggler. He smuggled in the tens of thousands of copies of the Word of God across the Iron Curtain. One time, the need was so great, he filled his car, he put him in the trunk, put them in the back seat, put them in the front seat, put them in the floorboards, had Bibles all inside his car. He pulls up to the security gate. He's trusting God. God, i got to get these Bibles across the border. The border guards know who he is. He had been beaten and arrested before for smuggling Bibles. And he simply prays to God, God, these, this, is your, this is your word. Those are your people. Do what you want. 
The guards pull his car over. Check under the hood. They're pulling the hubcaps off. They say, we know you've got Bibles in this car. Where are they? They're in the seats. And the guards couldn't see them. And they punched him a few times and they cursed at him. They said, tell us where the Bibles are. We'll kill you. And he said, look for yourself. And they were looking all through the car. Couldn't see him. Zoom, down the road he goes. Okay? What I'm saying to you is, that verse, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you are entered into their labors. You are sitting here receiving the benefit of other people's sweat, labor, and blood when it comes to this book. We are the benefactors of something that, I mean, you wouldn't like it if somebody marched in here and took our American flag and burned it in front of this church, would you? No, that would never happen. No way. Your Bible's way more important than the American flag. You are benefiting from other men's labors. Other men's sweat, other men's and women's blood when it comes to the testimony of this book. This Bible is precious, is what I'm saying to you. Amen? Amen. Now, back, in, back to John chapter 4, uh, when Jesus said, I have meat that ye, to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Turn your Bible to Job chapter 23, because I'm pretty sure he's quoting from here, or he is, Christ is using this as the basis of what he's trying to get across. And we know there's more than just this verse here, but, and we're going to look at some of them, but when he says that this book and the work that God sent him to do is our daily bread. He means it. Job 23.10 But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Remember what Psalm 12 says. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. And that's us. God will try us and he's purifying us. When you purify something, especially gold or silver, you have to heat it up to where it melts so you can get the dross out of it. The dross will always, the other metals will always separate from that gold. There is separation again. And what God's doing when, is when he sends you trials in your life, he is doing that to separate off the junk that we don't need anymore. Who in here has got stuff in their house you ain't touched in 10 years, but you just hate to let go of it? Let go of it. Okay? You're not going to fit in that dress anymore or those pants. Let, this, let, who, let goodwill have them. Amen? But that's what God's doing. He's separating us, clearing off the dross. He said, when he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Verse 12, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Now, food is necessary. He's not telling you to starve to death. He's not telling you to replace food with the Bible. What he's telling you is, out of your spirit... And your body, which one's going to live longer? Your spirit. How do you feed your spirit? With the word of God. So what's more important to take care of? Paul said bodily exercise profiteth little. And I believe in that. I believe in work, exercising, things like... I didn't say I practiced them all the time. I just said I believe in them. They benefit... The physical body. But the physical body is going to die. It is more beneficial to feed yourself on the word of God. I mentioned it yesterday in my broadcast. Again. 
about people who spend hours on the internet quote-unquote researching and in many cases that has become the replacement for the Word of God in their life well I go to Christian sites it's not the same thing well I listen to Pastor Mike that's definitely not the same thing I am not a replacement for your Bible time I'm not I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food and that's what Jesus is saying he said I have meat to eat that you know not of who brought you who brought something to eat my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work what was the last word he said on the cross Melissa finished finished and is it yep it's finished it's done and he's just going to come back and clean the mess up after that amen Deuteronomy chapter 8 turn there I'm going to give you something I, I don't know if you know this or not I don't know when the last time it was that I said this but I found it very interesting when Jesus was being tempted by Satan in um, let's see what Matthew, Matthew 3 I guess it is Luke 4 I think it is when Jesus is being tempted by Satan you know we've heard we know we've seen it that all three times in response to Satan's temptation Jesus quotes scripture what I didn't know for a long time didn't realize was not only was Jesus quoting scripture he was all three quotations are from the same book of the Bible Deuteronomy Deuteronomy fifth book of the Bible now, I'm not going to get into numbers tonight but I guarantee you there's a reason why He's quoting out of one book. In this case, it's Deuteronomy 8.3. Moses is talking to the people and he said, And he humbled thee. And he suffered, which means allowed thee to hunger. And fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know. That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live I mentioned in yesterday's broadcast a lady had sent me a letter when she was in a Pentecostal church and I'm not saying all Pentecostals believe this because I know they don't but she was taught that there were levels in heaven and certain people got better rewards in heaven and higher levels than other people did in heaven and I that's a lie that's a, to me that's almost that's almost blasphemy okay that's borderline heresy when you start talking talk like that but in those same groups you have people who say that they live in the spirit so much that they don't even need to read their Bible anymore because God talks directly to them number one that's a lie number two that is heresy to say that you are so spiritual minded and you are so full of God's Holy Spirit and you have reached such a high level with God that reading the Bible is just mundane to you that's just that's like what little children do like it's coloring books or something like that 
But there are people who actually believe that. That they are above the Bible. That they're above reading the Bible. They don't need it anymore. I'm telling you, Babylon has grabbed a hold of them. She runs, she runs them like a puppet. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Every word of God. Every single one of them. So we have Jesus saying in John, my meat is to do the will of him that, that sent me. And he, he tells his disciples, I have meat that you know not of. Job then telling us, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Deuteronomy 8, man shall not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Psalm 105 verse 40, the people asked and he brought quails, satisfied them with the bread of heaven. And here I am preaching on prayer. What did the people do in 10, Psalm 105 verse 40? What did they do? They asked. Now let me say this to anybody, because it's happened to me and, and probably will happen again, because I believe everybody goes in cycles. And let me say this to you. If, if you are somebody right now, who is in a place where it is nearly impossible for you to read your Bible and get anything out of it. Let me say this to you. If, if you're in that condition, ask God to change that. And I'm not telling you you need to change that. I'm not telling you that because you can't. I'm telling you, if you're in a place where I try to read my Bible, get nothing out of it, ask God to change that for you. My favorite verse, Derek, I wrote it in your Bible. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me. And I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. And any time that I find myself, and I do at times find myself reading the Bible, get nothing out of it. After a while I go, I'm not satisfied with that. I'm not okay with that. And it's not that I want to be... Uh, who was it in the book of Acts? The Athenians, who were always looking for some new thing. I don't care if it's something new that I didn't know out of the Bible or something that I knew and forgot and God's going to refresh it in me. But I want that Bible to be fresh when I read it. And I want God to do something in me when I read this book. I want to get something out of it when I read it. And what's happened is... People have gotten into that state and what somebody told them was, well, change Bibles. Go out and get an NIV because it's different. And some people, a lot of people have fallen for that. I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you, read the same thing again. Only this time, ask God to show you something out of the same thing you just read. Show you something you have never seen before. And you could read one verse and have that happen to you a thousand times in your life. Something brand new. That you've never known before. Mm. Because Amos 8.11. Behold the days come saith the Lord God. That I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread. Nor a thirst for water. But of hearing the words of the Lord. Famines happen. In every believer's life. Famines will happen. And when it does, you've got to fall on your face before God and say, God, feed me. I'm starving to death. Feed me. I need something from you, God. Put it in me. Do something new in me or redo the old thing that you've done in me and make me like it. But do something in me, God. That lets me know that I am still your child. If you ever find yourself in that position. You have merely to ask. Because that's what Psalm 105. The people asked. And did God deny them? No. He brought quails. 
And then he satisfied them with the bread of it. Look at that. Look at how he wrote that. He satisfied them with the bread of heaven. You can either eat a bowl of Rice Krispies and be starving to death in 30 minutes. Or you can eat some great big old Hardy's biscuits about that thick, right? Handmade by the hands of J.R. Cooley. He washed. Don't worry. And be satisfied with that. I love biscuits. Mm -mm. Greatest American food that there is is homemade hand squashed biscuits. And eat those things and be satisfied for a long time after that. He satisfied them with the bread of heaven. And all you have to do is ask. And God will give it to you. Amen. Oh, that's way too much for me to get into now. He answered and said, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's how he answered Satan. Amen. John 6, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but you get the idea. This Bible, the way Job said it, it's, it's more, it's better for me than my necessary food. I need it more than my daily biscuits. I need it more than that. Amen.